Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we're live. We're live from the Seek Outside tent here. It's classy. <laughs> it is classy. <laughs> so Micah, Ness, Micah, Ness, and I are sitting here inside the bug net uh, once again recording a podcast while mosquitoes are trying to get in uh, pretty fiercely, sitting on the outside wall right now trying to trying get to get ambiance. in. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. So we're here in Bird Creek, Alaska. For the Heather's Choice Company retreat, and uh, I just met Micah last night at the at the company retreat while we were out um, out doing some camping and rafting. So it's always interesting to to meet someone in that you know kind of environment, just out in the middle of nowhere. And and um, so Micah, do you want to tell tell everyone a little bit about yourself, who you are, and and uh, well, kind of what brought you here now too. Yeah, um, well, I, I grew up um, in Idaho. I was born and raised in Idaho in a, in a pretty large family. And um, we had a kind of a unique background with my dad. He always had his own business, started his own business. So we grew up uh, working with kind of the family family business. So we were instilled very at a very young age, the work ethic and and. and working hard for what you get and having a, a large family, we all had very different interests and we all kind of, uh, we're allowed to, to pursue those different interests in our, our, our upbringing. And for me, being outside was a huge part of that. I mean, that's, that's being in, raised in, in Idaho. There's a lot of outdoor things that you can be involved in. And my dad uh, was very big into hunting and so that was kind of a natural progression of, of being interested in what your dad is, you know, likes doing. But you have your own take and your own twist on that as well. And from a young age, uh, I, I've, I've always been enthralled with the outdoors in various different capacities. As, as, a, young, you know, as a young kid, even before I was old enough to go hunting, uh, I would be pursuing and going after bugs and insects and, and running around with a butterfly net trying to catch the most variety of different uh, things flying around or crawling on the ground and bringing back snakes and birds and frogs and everything else back to the house. Yeah. <laughs> My mom loved that. We... She still tells the story of when I, she was cleaning out the pockets in my uh, pants and washing them, you know, in the evening or whatever. And, and I run down there and reach into the pocket and grab out this dead snake that was inside the pocket that somehow she didn't find. And, uh, and you found that was, it. <laughs> that, that, yeah, I remembered uh, late, almost too late that uh, had a little had a little present in there. And because you find all kinds of interesting things while you're out exploring as a kid. And so oh, uh, yeah. what a better place to put them in your pocket, you know. <laughs> 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 and uh, And then my dad... He actually didn't grow up hunting with his dad. He grew up on a farm and, but had a big desire to go hunting. So when he had us as sons, my brother and I, we had five sisters. So the fact that we had, that he had two sons right in the middle, I think God gave him a little, little bit of a, a, a reprieve from, <laughs> from, from the ladies in the household. So he, he definitely enjoyed having us around and being able to take us out hunting. Even if we weren't old enough to hunt ourselves, we'd go along and uh, retrieve the ducks <laughs> when they, when they yeah. fell and, and spend the cold mornings, you know, bundled up like crazy. And that was a big part of instilling our love for the outdoors because my dad was able to share it with us. Awesome. No, that, that's cool. It's, I mean, similar to, to the way I grew up, but in Pennsylvania, just a little different, but my family was, um, is a big hunting family and outdoor family. So I, I don't think I really had a choice, but to, uh, yeah. become a hunter at, in that point. But growing up in Idaho, you have an interesting dynamic there where you have a lot of big game available yeah. to, to hunt and kind of get your feet wet and a lot of wilderness basically. Mm -hmm. And you said in the Boise areas where you grew up? Yeah, just outside of Boise and Nampa. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. We moved around a little bit, but uh, primarily in that area. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, have you, and you, and you live in in that area currently? 
I do. Okay. Yeah. Moved back. Yeah. Okay. Where did you move to for, for a while? Uh, I was in Alaska for about six years. Uh, when I, after high school, I moved up there and was there for about six years. And then it's about, about been about six years since I moved back, back okay. to Idaho. So had to get back and back to the roots. <laughs> yeah. What was your, what was your reason to, to get out and move to Alaska? <clears throat> you know, uh, contrary to what I think many people think of the Alaska as being a, a the ideal place to get away from as a kid or just dreaming about Alaska. I, I didn't really know anything about Alaska. I mean, I, I loved to hunt and getting to hunt with my dad. And obviously we have lots of great hunting in Idaho and I really had no idea of what the full things that were available in Alaska. And uh, a lot of people would want to go up there, but the only experience I had was uh, when a, a good friend of ours, a family friend of ours, was a guide in Alaska, and he would come back in the off season and and show us videos of his escapades in Alaska and guiding for caribou and bear and and I thought it was really cool, but I just didn't really think about it that much. Of you know, it wasn't like oh I, I need to go do that. It was just something like wow that's really cool. But my dad had the foresight of of seen it as a great opportunity just to just to do it i mean he was he was into it to uh, allow experiences to come about whatever they end up turning into you know you don't know until you do it and so uh, my dad actually set up and, and talked to our friend to allow me to come up for a summer once i was old enough and they this was i was probably about 12 years old when they were talking about it initially and figured about 16 was a good year you know kind of uh, figuring things out and having a good, uh, you know, benefit of being in the outdoors and appreciating it as well. Yeah. And so I was able to go up to when I was 16, uh, first experience was there five months, <laughs> a bit of a, a bit of a long summer and it, it really grew on me. I, I was able to experience Alaska in a, in a very extreme sense, if you will, since I was off the grid, uh, was not on the road system, flew into Anchorage, jumped on a plane that night, was out in the bush of Alaska for five months. Didn't, didn't go back into town. And it's a bit of an extreme version of Alaska, but it was also a very good introduction to what would become what I really enjoyed doing. Yeah. It sounds like, yeah, you jumped right into it full force there. Yeah. That was, that was a crash course for sure. (laughs) Yeah. So, and and so when you came to Alaska, then what were you, what were you doing for work? What brought you, brought you up there? So the, the guy, uh, again, our family friend, I came up that summer to work with him and I had a lot of construction and building background from my, uh, working with my dad growing up, he had a disaster restoration business. So both my brother and I grew up working with him and in his crews building, tearing down and working a lot in, in just how things are built. And so we kind of had that good general knowledge of that. So I came up to work and build a cabin, but also since the guy I was working for was a guide and outfitter and had done that kind of similarly from an early age, then I was able to experience that side of, of the business as well as almost an entrepreneur, um, uh, rather, no, not an entrepreneur, um, as a, an apprentice type thing underneath okay. him. So he had a lot of different knowledge, but I was able to learn, uh, the, how it is living out in the middle of nowhere in Alaska, but also how to, uh, be a guide. And I went out and packed out a moose that first year. And that was kind of a first <laughs> initial experience into that whole, whole realm. Surprisingly, that did not uh, scare me away. I was, I was yeah. still able to, I still enjoyed it. It was, it was a great experience and, and a challenging one, but that was, I think the part of it that it may be challenging, but it was still the adventure of it. That was so exciting for me to, to be able to be a part of this process of, of someone that uh, was able to harvest an animal and then, and then hauling out the meat and taking care of the animal and learning that process in a much bigger scale, even than a deer or something like that in Idaho that I'd been familiar with before. Yeah. I mean, a moose is, is a whole, <laughs> I, I couldn't whole other animal. imagine. I mean, I saw my first moose here and live on foot right in the city of Anchorage basically came out from around a mailbox 
and drove the car next to it. And I was like, holy shit, that thing is huge, you know? <laughs> they, they, they are a whole nother, whole nother animal in every meaning of the word. <laughs> and, and a friend of mine did a, a float trip up here last year. We took a raft through and um, just did it, did it themselves but went down and floated and they shot a couple of moose. And he goes, you don't realize how big they are until they're even on the ground. And you have to figure out how you're going to take the meat off them and carry it back to the raft. He's like, it was just insane. Yeah. It, it's a big challenge sit of how you when you take down a moose. Yeah. <laughs> so that didn't scare you away. It and didn't, surprisingly. <laughs> and that's that's definitely one of the harder probably tasks of, of being a guide or even a packer uh, and being out on the on the – and that type of arena is because you, you have to work pretty hard. And, uh, I was no, no stranger to hard work. And that was, that was just kind of the first, the first step. And through the rest of that summer, I didn't, um, I was involved partially with, with those hunts, but I didn't get to spend a ton of time out in the camps because most of the places were accessed by super cub, which is a two seater plane. And just, the cost of flying someone additional out to a location when you have the pilot that's a that's a whole nother extra cost it's not always feasible in the in the hunt plan yeah. and so i didn't get a, a whole lot more experience in the field aside from that one packing trip because that was necessary to to help the process of getting that moose out uh, but it was enough of a taste to kind of see what it was like and then i also towards the end of the, my time there in october when the snow started falling the I was tasked with a, a recon mission on a remote river of Alaska to go and basically float from one point to another point, spend about four or five days, have a tag, hunt for myself as well, maybe get a black bear or something like that, and kind of see where some suitable places would be to land, maybe set up a camp for a winter hunting location. And that was a bit of a interesting experience because it was my first time being completely alone out in the middle of nowhere for that long of time in a completely foreign place. I mean, this is before having, you know, all the modern conveniences we have now with uh, yeah, texting the, devices. Yeah, the and inReach and everything inReach that you could and, have. and all these SOS devices. I mean, we I did have a... Uh, a satellite phone that I was able to have as, as an emergency thing, but it wasn't like you're checking in every day and knowing what's going on. It's just kind of like, all right, this is where you need to be on, uh, uh, you know, on the map. And that's, that's where you need to be in about five days. <laughs> How old were you when you did that? I was 16 years old. When you did that by yourself? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. I, I would say Alaska caused me to grow up very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> it was a bit of a pressure cooker. And having experiences like that, where even at the end of the trip, we had, when I was supposed to be at a certain place to fly out, uh, he actually did arrive on the day he was supposed to and flew right over my camp and kept going down the river. And I thought something was wrong. Something, I mean, I I was completely fabricated out of what was going on because he didn't see me. I mean, he just kept flying down the river. And... I was left to myself to sit there and wonder what was going on or why I was not there. Actually, I remember now I didn't have a satellite phone. I had a radio to communicate with a plane if it needed to come by. And I knew I could float down maybe another 20, 30 miles down the river and end up in a town, a small little village if I needed to. But that was beyond where I was supposed to end up. So I had no way to communicate with him at that point. And then the next day he flew back and actually did see me and landed, but I spent the whole night wondering what was going to go on, how I was going to get out, what was the emergency situation, like why he didn't see me, what was going on. I was, I was freaked out. In the middle and of nowhere. In Alaska. the middle of nowhere, wondering, waiting, why, why. <laughs> and the next day he comes in and lands on the beach and, and basically he, he was flying into the sun and couldn't see me when he was coming down the river. And it was, wow. it was kind of one of those things that it wasn't as big of a deal for him. He knew he could come back and find me, but it was a, it was a bit of a, a shakeup for me. Oh yeah. At 16 years old, even at, you know, even at 25, 30, it doesn't matter. That'd still freak you out. <laughs> yeah. Why someone, yeah. you know, went yeah. past you if you're not used to, used to that. You get those experiences in Alaska for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very big. Yeah. I don't know how else to put it from just a very a little, simple yeah, just standpoint. A little bit. <laughs> it's very big and yeah. remote type uh, type areas there. So, yeah. yeah, so you stayed here for a while and then did more guiding, correct? Yeah, so that was my first year, and then I was still in high school, so I went back 
and, and finished up the last two years of high school, kept coming back each summer, and eventually got my guide license at 18, which was the minimum age you had to be to get an assistant, assistant guide license to work with an outfitter. And uh, at that point, I decided to go ahead and move up to Alaska full-time and, and work basically year-round and pursuing this uh, this uh, adventure of, of guiding and outdoor adventures and stuff, but that's also what led me into capturing visual experiences as well. So okay, so as far as visual experiences, what do you what do you mean there? Well, as as a kid, I'd grown up um, with my brother making movies and capturing uh, just. No, I wouldn't say stories at that point. We were making up our own stories and <laughs> and creating uh, action movies and and James Bond esque or or uh, chase scenes and that kind of thing. Very primitively with our home video cameras and high eight film cameras that had to record onto a VHS when we were <laughs> uh, when we were editing them together. We didn't have computers to edit together. It was very. Uh, it wasn't very simple and or easy to be able to create stuff that we can now. So, yeah. uh, but that's what my brother and I were really passionate about was, was just spending that time in, in junior high and even earlier making these videos and taping headphones onto the front microphone to get music and <laughs> all kinds of yeah. very, very old fashioned ways. And so when I started going to Alaska, that, uh, it was, I didn't do as much of that in between when I was going through high school, but when I went to back to Alaska, it's, you know, everybody says you can't take a bad picture in Alaska and <laughs> it's, it's definitely an awe inspiring scenery all around you. And so that, that desire to, to capture images, you know, around me or what was happening or creating was really starting to come out again as, as you have such an incredible backer up as Alaska. Yeah. And the guy that I was working for as well, he also had an interest in, in, photography and videography as well and he was able to kind of help rekindle that uh that desire for capturing images and teaching me more about photography and how to compose an image well and to do that not just in the hunting but also just capturing landscapes and looking at the things around you and how to take because i was doing uh photos with film so you can't just spray and pray and hope you get some great photos. You actually had yeah. to take some time and compose your shot and make sure because you had 25 shots in that roll, you know, and yeah. you had to put in another roll. And, and it that was, cost, uh, <laughs> you know, that cost 14, 15 yeah. bucks and to develop. You find right? out a month later if it actually was good when you had to send it in somewhere to get developed yeah. and you get them back. And, and being that we were in the bush, you had to send it off, you know, and through the mail to get it developed. So that was kind of my first intro into photography was having something that you had to take your time and, and figure out. And so he helped to kind of develop that, if you will. Yeah. Um, and he was also had the interest in video. So he, he, as part of my job, he purchased a, a nice video camera and software editing to actually learn how to use on a computer. And that was my first foray into actually creating films, uh, aside from the little primitive stuff we'd done as a kids. Okay. And then that's led you to kind of where you're at today as a career in outdoor film, like <coughs> filmmaking. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it definitely was a, that was the, the starting point for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of, a lot of things took place between then and now. And, but that was definitely kind of the, the initial stepping stones that kind of put me in that direction and, and, uh, led me to where I am today. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what inspires you, I guess, to keep doing that and keep filming? And because, I mean, I'd, I've seen some of your, your photo work. I haven't seen any of your video work yet. Um, but it's awesome stuff. And just a, it takes a different eye. It takes a creative eye to lo look through that lens and see what you're seeing. You know what I mean? It's not anyone can, you know, buy a good camera and, you know, think that they're a photographer or a videographer. But it's different when you have, you have that, that sort of eye and that f for that sort of creativity and that, that passion behind it. So what, what kind of sparked that for you and made you, that keeps you doing it today? I think a lot of it came through actually guiding and that realizing the desire that I have to share experiences because what I've told people before is, is guiding is, is, 
it really is comes down to sharing experience with somebody else that may never be able to do that without the help of somebody else. I mean, they can't just go out and hunt some of these animals without having a guide. And you are, in a sense, creating this experience for them. And ideally, it's a, it's a great experience. It's one that they can fully appreciate and enjoy. And that's what they're coming for is really an experience. Not everybody has the, the I would say, the that type of a mindset. Sometimes they're just there to accomplish a goal or they're just there to kind of check a box. And, and, and unfortunately not everybody can appreciate the full experience of what it is to be in Alaska or, or pursuing any animal really in, in wherever they may go, whether, uh, in a foreign country or the U S or anywhere. And so as a guide, you, you are tasked with a lot of different different jobs. You're, you're taking care of them. You have to be not only a guide, you have to be a cook, you have to be a packer, you have to be a psychologist when things go bad and the weather's bad and you're stuck in a tent and you're having to, to keep someone motivated and positive when things are really not very positive all around you. So I feel like it, it leads to a lot of different areas where you can have a positive impact on somebody. Yeah. And I didn't realize it until I was in Alaska of that connection between that and also uh, creating films and capturing photos. It's, it's really is you're creating an experience for someone, whether it might be for a split second when they scroll past that picture, or it might be a little bit longer when you're creating a video that they're going to watch and experience. You're giving them a, a journey down and, and creating an emotion that they can have with that you know, emotional connection potentially, or, or motivation for action, uh, or just creating that emotion to make them feel a certain way, happy, sad, you know, uh, motivated to get out and do something. And so that's where the connection really came from guiding and realizing that that was something I was passionate about was being able to create something that can impact somebody to some extent. And, and it's not through every single piece. I mean, I think it does come down to, having an eye for what is interesting and that people are, are wanting to be drawn into. Um, and part of it, I think you can definitely learn the, the, that art of taking a good photo and composing a good photo and what makes a good photo. But there is some part of a, something that can be innate in what you do. And I feel like that was an early age with my brother and I was just, seeing things around us maybe a little bit differently and, and being able to find those things that kind of set apart uh, an image or a photo. And that that never changes for me. It doesn't matter what the backdrop is, whether it is something I'm really passionate about, such as the hunting and outdoors and that kind of thing, or even in anything in creating a, a video for a business or telling someone's story that is uh, impactful you know, it may not be real related to the areas of expertise that I enjoy, but it is still capturing someone's story or image or, or experience that you can share with others and, and create that, that piece that someone else can kind of dive into even for a split moment or hopefully longer than that. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's awesome to hear that. And, and I think, I mean, I, I know when I see a good piece put together, um, I'm going to speak f- specifically to film. When you watch it and you, when you get emotion drawn to you, get pumped up when you watch a film. Yeah. That, I'm sure for you, that's a satisfying, yeah. you know, thing. And I I get that through when I do writing and I'm writing for people and I get somebody saying, oh, man, you know, that's awesome. That, that you know, hunt you went on. I, I really want to do that. I'm going to I'm going to go out of my comfort zone and and go hunt elk this year do something that's an awesome feeling that you help that person out through capturing the experiences that you're getting to have and and be able to to put that in front of other people's eyes and especially video and and photography i mean that stuff it's visual you know what i mean you you just it you connect a lot easier than even having to read something it's just it's there in front of you and if you can create that those right emotions, then I think you've done something, you know, and, and some people's different, you know, each, each person has different reactions, uh, to, to different things and maybe motivated by different things. You know, something I may watch may get me excited where it, 
it's not a big deal to you. You know, it's, it's each person specific, but that's no, that's awesome. That's awesome to hear there. So, and so you've created a whole business and a whole lifestyle around that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Between uh, my brother and I. So initially when I was living in Alaska, I would come back and I had started making these films and, and photos up in Alaska for different companies there. But my brother was kind of doing a similar path back in Idaho as well, learning film and kind of advancing some of the, the passions that we had done as a kid as well on his own his own side. And uh, my dad being the, the entrepreneurial spirit that he is, he had several side projects that he had going that required video and photography. And it was kind of the extra impetus to to create something and be a part of something that would be more in a, in a business format where we we're actually not just going around and creating stuff on our own or for our own purposes, but also creating it for a purpose and for a, a business or promotion and uh, promotional type material that would allow somebody else to get their message out. And so as I was coming back in the winter time in the off season from guiding and, and doing my work up in Alaska, then I started uh, initially actually working, uh, in a local competitions for short films in Idaho and competing against my brother with those. But then we would work together on these other projects. And so we had this kind of this, this brotherly competition going on between yeah. video. And, and I feel like it actually helped us to get better because we could see what each other was doing and, and figuring out ways that we could make it interesting or, or go to the next level or make it, you know, what we were doing even cooler. Yeah. And, and eventually that led to where, because we were doing these other side projects together, we realized how much more effective we could be working together and we had our own strengths and our own weaknesses and, and pairing up together with both of us really helped us combine what we were able to do and make a, a really good team to cover both of our sides of, of what we were good at. And, and that was really the, the avenue we wanted to end up. We saw our, our dad being able to make his own way with his own business and, and put in that extra time to make that work and support his family that way. And we both were drawn to that and wanted to do it for ourselves and have, have a business that we were invested in that we could call the shots and, and create and, and not just clock in and clock out every day yeah. and be something that we were really wanting to do. And we had that option to, especially now with, with the tools and things that are available, a lot of, you know, so many people have that opportunity. They can go and create something that they're passionate about. So we, we took that and ran with it. And, and because we had a, an opportunity to make a film after we've been doing some videos of weddings and businesses, uh, there was a company that uh, was filming a race and, or we were going to film this race for uh, another group. And it was a, a foot race, an ultra marathon race. And we, they wanted us to come and film it, but they didn't have any way to, it would just, the race was starting out. They didn't have any money, so they couldn't pay us, but they could promote us and, and get our name out there. Well, we didn't have a name. <laughs> we just had us, you know, it was just us as, as uh, freelance, you know, work on, on our own. And so we didn't have a name or anything to promote. So it was a matter of coming up with a business name and getting the business license and making it happen just because we needed to in that setting. And that was kind of the extra push to get it to that next level of, uh, making it into a business and really, really getting serious about it. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome. And, um, what's the name of your business? Uh, Silverline Films. Okay. Yeah. So to jump a little bit different gears here this morning, uh, we had tents set up next to each other, woke up in the morning and your tent was empty and I ran into my brother and he's like, yeah, I was down by the, he was, I was down by the glacier taking some photos and he goes, Micah came down. I was like, Hey, I'm going to, there's, there's a cabin. Okay. As far as you can see up on top of this, this mountain way up there. And he goes, Hey, do you want to go for a run with me? I'm going to run up to that cabin. He's like, uh, I don't know if I can, uh, run up there right now. And uh, so anyways, what I'm getting at here is, uh, it sounds like you like to run a little bit. You got up this morning and ran whatever it was, three, three and a half, four miles straight up to the cabin and back down. And when I say straight up, it's, it's up there. 
So you like to do a little bit of running, yeah. huh? <laughs> yeah, you could you could say uh, I got a running problem for sure. It was, uh, uh, which is kind of funny because it started around the same time as when we started our, our video business. Uh, that race that we filmed for getting the extra push to get our name and our business together was also where it created a switch that I feel like switched on that was off in my mind about my opinion of running and what that was really all about. And this was an ultra marathon race, which is basically a distance or anything over a, a marathon distance. And these people were out running in horrible conditions with rain and snow and mud and just, and yes, they were working hard. Not everybody was smiling, but they were doing it and they were, they were enjoying it. I mean, it was, it was something that was challenging that they took on and they didn't call in sick because it was a bad conditions out. They went out and, and pushed hard. And it was really just something that, that drew me in of, of what these people were, were all about and why they were going out and, and pushing themselves so far. And so in that same process of time, I, I filmed that race. We watched a film about a hundred mile race, the Western States 100 of, of multiple ultra marathon elite runners that were racing against each other that was a really inspirational documentary about these guys racing against one another in this crazy crazy ultra marathon 100 mile race and and then i read a a book called born to run and it just really set my who wrote that book um i've heard it before and i'm trying i can't think of it off the top of my head but i'll i'll think i'll think of the name i can't think you're not the the first person that's brought that that name up yeah to me, so that's yeah why it's 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 quite the it was quite the the revolutionary book it talks a lot about the history of running in in different cultures from africa to mexico and the fact that the body and the people are capable of of so much more than what we do and kind of the natural history of what our bodies are capable of yeah uh in the in more specifically in running and even in health and, and wellness and all that kind of stuff. So it, it connects to a lot of different things and it really just brought to my attention and what this thing is about running and what it can do for a person and, and create a, a, just a lifestyle for, for somebody. And, and I, and I, I enjoyed being, uh, fit in a sense. I wasn't working out all the time or, or doing all kinds of active things, but being in the outdoors, especially guiding, I was doing a lot of active pushing things a lot, you know, packing out animals from the middle of nowhere. And I mean, you push yourself beyond what is is sane sometimes when you're hiking way back into some crazy remote locations, as you know, and just, just having to put in that extra time and carry that extra weight and pack out that animal and climb that mountain or cross that river. I mean, there's a lot of challenging things in our in, in the hunting side of things and, and guiding as well. Um, and so this was just kind of a natural progression for that. I think was having the, the ability and opportunity to, uh, push myself beyond the, the norm, I guess. Yeah. And it was a challenge and it kept me, uh, in shape. It, it kept me in, uh, the outdoors and spending lots of time and the group I was in when I started running, was into long distance. <laughs> yeah. And so it was, it was more of an adventure and a challenge than it was just going out and running a couple miles to get speed work or, or running fast. And so because of that, you were able to enjoy the surroundings you're in and you end up in some pretty cool places when you can just go out and just run and, and run up to 10, 20 miles or something. Versus Not have a cap on it. <laughs> just go until you're ready to just, go back. Just go. Yeah. Yeah. And then just go and go off of your body and then realizing what is possible. And, and I, I started with short runs and did a couple 10 mile races and ended up jumping into the, uh, the long distance, um, ultra marathon side of things pretty quickly and realizing that it is possible to run 32 miles or more or a hundred miles and really push your body and realize that, uh, we are capable of a lot more than we, we realize sometimes. So what, what's the furthest you've ran? A uh, hundred miles was, was, was that the longest, holy longest shit. distance. And I, I wouldn't say run, running 
100 miles is, is a little bit of a stretch for me. Maybe some people in the elite category can do that where they run the whole time. Uh, you do a lot of walking. I mean, you're, you're, you're moving at a decent pace. You have to finish in a certain amount of time. Um, yeah. But you do. That's, you ran 100 miles. <laughs> don't, don't try to, don't try to cover it was, that. It was, it was about <laughs> like an old man hobbling with uh, sticks at the end. But I did, I did complete it. And it was the definitely the hardest thing I have done to date. And, uh, but realizing that the body is capable of doing that in, in less than two days. And, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So what, how did, I'm sure that helps you from a hunting standpoint too, just because there's a lot of miserable moments on a hunt and you having that background of it can probably make you push through it a little bit. It is. Yeah. I think it, 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 it crosses over to a lot of things in life and, and especially hunting because yeah, to, to stay out there when the conditions are not always good or the weather gets bad or the animals aren't there when you want them to be and you got to go over that next ridge or over to the next valley. Um, I think just having the, the mindset that you can push through that. You can go farther than you realize, even though your legs may not want to, or your body may not want to. And, and, you know, you have that goal that you're pushing for. You may not always get to that goal. You may not get that animal, but you know that, okay, I'm going to spend this amount of time and I'm going to push as much as I can and, and put out my best effort. And I think having, having your, your, your body capable of that is a big part of it. You know, not, not worrying about, uh, getting too fatigued and, and having a, a, a medical emergency out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. And so making sure that you're prepared for that and running long distances is, is in a, in a small, uh, almost a, a condensed sense of a, of a really extreme experience. And so when you put yourself into that and realize you can go beyond that, then when you're out in the, the day-to-day life or everything else, you feel like, okay, I can, I can take that on. It doesn't, doesn't matter how, how hard it may look. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I I completely agree with you there. And not that I do anything as far as an ultra running standpoint, but when you do anything that's hard and puts you out of your comfort zone like that, and, and I like to call them the different events, whether it's crucible events, almost where you, whether that's a long, maybe that's a long hike that you're going for a few different days with a weighted pack that it's out of your comfort zone a little bit, you're pushing through no matter what it is. And it, it'll make you stronger in the mountains for hunting. And then also personally in life, when things come up, when challenges come up, yeah. you can realize what's not really as big of a deal as you think it is mm-hmm. and figure out a way to get around it and, and deal with it. So Exactly. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to add on that side of things from the ultra running perspective? No, I, I think it's, it's, uh, um, yeah, I think it does, does apply to a lot of different areas of life and, and, uh, and, you know, it keeps you, keeps you motivated, keeps you moving. And I think having a a body that's in, in motion a lot is, is going to keep you, keep you on the, the right path of the long term for sure. Okay. I have one last question for you and I ask everyone the same question. So how do you define adventure? So what pops in your head when you think of adventure, no matter if that's in, that could be hunting, that can be life, that can be whatever, whatever you define it. I think, I think it's definitely something that, that takes you out whether it's outdoors or somewhere else that, that allows you to be in awe, but also to, to have something that is, uh, challenging and different that kind of awakens the senses. It's, it's something that I tend to relate it more so to an outdoor experience in that sense, but I think it can be in other ways as well, where they are just, experience another culture or, or spending time with somebody else. And it's, and it's something that really can get you outside of, uh, outside of the daily norm, or outside the daily, of your comfort zone, the daily grind, the daily comfort zone. And it's, and it's really something that it, it allows us to be alive. I think having, having adventure in our life can have, can take a lot of different forms, but it does keep us 
realizing that there's more around us. It's, it's not the daily day to day in and out. It's, it's something different and you get out and experience it for sure because it's, it's, uh, it's key to, to keeping us, keeping us alive and, yeah. and, uh, and growing as well. Awesome. So where can, uh, people find a little bit more about what you're doing and, and some stuff with, with your company? So on the, on the business side of things, uh, Silverline Films is, is, uh, our business, my brother and I and our team. And so we're, we're producing content, photo and video in a lot of different areas, predominantly in the outdoor industry, but also in, in, uh, businesses and other things. So our website, just silverlinefilms.com, uh, you can find us on there also Facebook, Instagram, all of those areas. It's all Silverline Films. And then, uh, on, on my personal side, I, I share some of just the, the daily stuff that, that I do and adventures and side things that I enjoy to, to do in the, in, again, primarily in the outdoor realm, uh, on Instagram is, is Wilderness Pro and uh twitter mike and nass and so between my name and and wilderness pro you can find uh find me in all those other locations as well so awesome well hey i appreciate you coming on here micah and it was great meeting you we're gonna have to to meet up some more here and yes and more adventures to come m- more adventures yes. to come I, I'm, I'm all for starts that. in alaska and goes beyond <laughs> yep I, I completely agree well awesome. again thank you and uh, we'll talk to you soon man thanks Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.